Hello, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Lori Pollack from the University of Delaware, and today we have our speaker, Nancy Amato from Texas A&M, and she's going to be talking about planning motions for robots, crowds, and proteins. So these webinars, if you haven't uh, joined us yet in the past, they're, they're meant to be interactive. So some of you may be joining us individually or as a class or an ACMW chapter, an ACM chapter. Uh, we, we want to get your responses throughout. So we want to hear your questions, your comments, and your answers to our poll questions. In order to join in on these interactive activities, we encourage you to join via either a computer, a cell phone, or a tablet uh, using the WebEx app. This will allow you to be very interactive. If you have any questions on how to download or set up the app, feel free to submit your questions and a WebEx staff member will assist you. You can see the question and answer panel uh, down on your right bottom corner. Uh, we also want to mention that at the end of this webinar, we have an evaluation survey for you, and we really appreciate you taking the time to fill out that survey. We use this feedback to improve these webinars and also to give us suggestions for uh, future topics and speakers. So we definitely want your feedback. Again, this is where the question and answer box is, and you can type. We really uh, appreciate questions or concerns anytime throughout, and we will have people answering them for you. Some of you may have already found that there's a poll section on the WebEx app, um, and it's here on the lower right-hand side of your screen. There's currently an open poll question. Um, is everyone seeing the poll? Uh, once there is an open-ended poll question, you take the time to answer, and then throughout the question the year, we will get all of the aggregate answers, and we will continue with those, those answers. So let's get started with our speaker today, Nancy Amato. Nancy is a Regents Professor and Unical Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at Texas A&M. She co-directs the Parasol Lab. Her main interests of research focus on robotics and motion planning, computational biology and geometry, and parallel and distributed computing. She received her undergrad degrees in Mathematical Sciences and Economics from Stanford and MS and PhD from UC Berkeley and University of Illinois, respectively. She's won many awards. Um, she's co-chaired the Robot, the, the main national, international, actually, Conference on Robotics and uh, Automation. You might have heard of it, ICRA, and also the conference the Robotic Science and Systems Conference. In particular, she uh, received the 2014 CRA Haberman Award uh, and the inaugural NC Witt Harold Notkin Research and Graduate Mentoring Award in 2014. Uh, she is a AAAS Fellow, an ACM Fellow, and an IEEE Fellow. So let me turn it over to Nancy now. Okay, um, let me get set up here. Can you all see my, hopefully I'm presenting, and I'm sharing my screen, great. So thanks for joining us today. I have to admit I'm a little bit nervous. This is the first time I've ever given a webinar, so um, hopefully it'll go well. <laughs> so um, as Lori mentioned, I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about um, motion planning, planning motions for robots, crowds, and proteins. But before we do that, let me tell you a little bit about me. Um, I basically am pretty much an accidental computer scientist. Um, I was not a computer scientist in my um, undergraduate days, but when I was looking for a job when I was graduating from college, they um, basically had an offer to go to graduate school in computer science from this program called BELCOR, one year on campus program. 
And I am so grateful to them because that was like how I found my calling. And after that, I was doing um, computer science throughout. So I've been at, after I graduated with my PhD from the University of Illinois, I came to Texas A&M and I've been a faculty member here ever since. I um, am going to talk to you today a little bit about my research and part of my research really only the part that's related to motion planning and robotics. I also spend a lot of my time doing research on parallel algorithms and designing algor um, data structures and algorithms for parallel computers. Um, I have a pretty large research group, um, and you're actually going to have the pleasure of meeting one of my graduate students later on in this webinar. She was actually a Drew student with me a couple years ago, and now she's a PhD program, Diane, Deanne Uwasu, and, and you'll meet her later on. Um, but I have a pretty large group in terms of including postdocs, PhD students, um, and a lot of actually undergraduate researchers, some of, us, some of whom are joining us today. In addition to that, I also actually have a husband who's a computer science professor here at Texas A&M. We went to grad school together and then we came here together. Actually, I came first to Texas A&M and then he came here and joined me. We don't have children, but we have Bernie's Mountain Dogs and you can see a few of them on um, the, the slide now. The, the, slide, the one that shows two of them together, those are my newest dogs, Fred and Wilma. They're just barely a year old and they're um, Lots of fun, but also um, not completely trained yet. <laughs> um, in addition to um, dogs, I like to travel. I also like to eat. And um, one of the great things about being a professor is that you get to do a lot of both. You get to travel to really cool places where conferences are, and you get to enjoy um, experimenting with lots of different cultures. So finally, my most favorite trip I've had, I guess, in the past few years was a trip to Machu Picchu in Peru, which I'd always wanted to go to. It was really, really awesome. And another thing I got to do was do a fly in a small plane over these things called the Nazca Lines. I encourage you to, to Google them and see what they are. Very cool stuff. So, okay, so let's go ahead and get started with um, the talk about my research. So first off, um, the, what we're going to talk about today is motion planning. And in its um, simplest form, motion planning is you're given a, some movable object, um, and you're given a description of the environment, and you have a start and a goal configuration of that movable object, and your job is to find a sequence of valid configurations that takes you from the start to the goal. What's shown here in the slide is a simple example where the movable object is just a little bar, and you need to move it from one um, kind of room in this environment to the next one through that hole. What's being animated is this puzzle called an alpha puzzle, which um, maybe some of you have seen it. I have actually the prop here. It's two twisted nails. This one comes from Mexico. And once you know the trick, which is this particular configuration, it's actually pretty easy to solve this problem. But, we're, but, we're, but, we're, but what we're going to talk about today are algorithms which could actually figure this out on their own. And it turns out this is a really, really tough problem. And this problem, the alpha puzzle, is one of the kind of classic benchmarks for motion planning problems. So we're going to have a poll now, which has hopefully popped up on your screen. And what I want you to do is think about what are the potential applications of motion planning, that basic problem that we just discussed. So. What you do, I guess, is you select the answer, and after about 20 seconds, we will see it. I don't think, do I need to do anything? But what we talked about was uh, just a basic example of motion planning, that simple one. Think about which of these other ones might be examples. Should I answer it, too? Um, has the poll, the poll is ended, it says. I don't, do you? Okay, so what we see is that 
93% of you have participated have selected the correct answer, which is all of the above. And that's true, actually. That's one of the amazing things about motion planning for me is that it has so many diverse applications. What we're going to do now is we're going to go through a few of them. So what's shown here is a very hard motion planning problem. Both of these ones shown on this slide come from uh, computer-aided design applications. And they both come from General Electric, and they're examples of cases where the engineer initially came up with some design, but then changed it because they weren't able to verify within the computer-aided design system that the design would actually work for them. The one that's moving right now is they designed these two parts and they knew that they needed to fit together, but they didn't know whether it was possible to actually insert the one into the other after they had been manufactured. So they actually didn't go with this design. This animation that you've seen here was actually found by my group's motion planner, and it was the first time that they realized that they could have gone with that design they liked. The other example um, that's shown here is this part here that's circled, it's the same one that's green above. This is a part that they needed to be able to remove and replace within a small amount of time as part of the annual maintenance for this, it's part of an aircraft engine. And what you can see here is that the pipes have been bent a little bit, and this is because the engineer thought that the way that the part would be removed is that they would kind of rotate it and pull it out directly this way. It turned out that wasn't necessary. Using a motion planner, we found a path that basically just pulled it out directly, so there was no need for them to, to put those bends in the pipes for that maintenance problem. And you could imagine that if we had a motion planner integrated with a computer-aided design system, then we would have been able to solve this problem and go directly with a better solution. Another benefit is it could be used for training examples. Can you imagine like a manual rather than looking at just the schematics of how they show motions for how to like put something together if you could actually see it animated in either a virtual reality or an augmented reality environment? Okay, so here's another example where we have um, systems that have many joints. So the one that's moving right now, this is basically a skeleton that was extracted from a baby model and a robot model, and we fit um, motion capture data from a boxer to both of them. The, there's many different joints there. Now there's a couple other examples. The soccer ball that's folding together, that's actually not too difficult of a one, but it has many different parts to it. And then the, the hardest one on this um, slide is actually the, the um, lamp that's moving. It may be, hopefully you can see it, but there's three um, coordinated loops that have to move together, and that makes it actually a quite constrained and difficult problem. Okay, let's look at the next one. Here, so far, all of the motions that we saw were for a single moving object. In this slide here, we have to, we're looking at coordinated behaviors for multiple agents. What's shown on the bottom of the screen right now is a shepherd, the, the large humanoid type figure, and it's trying to herd those five little duckies into that corridor, that corral there. In this particular case, the shepherd knows where the duckies should go, but the ducks, they don't. They just want to stay together and stay away from the shepherd. Now there's two more that are moving. This uh, assembly pu puzzle up in the upper left of your screen, this is basically a disassembly puzzle, which is kind of a, a toy analog of the assembly problems that we just saw. And on the upper right of the screen, it's kind of hard to see, but there are Im or figures, individuals, that were in this you know, stylized building, and what they're doing is they're exiting the building and then moving to their vehicles, collecting at the vehicles in whatever group of them, and then they're leaving together. So in this case, we have multiple agents that we need to plan the motions for simultaneously. This example here is we now have a deformable object. So what we have here is we have the same path, and it's being followed by the teapot and the rubber ducky, and they are both deforming to avoid collision with that um, obstacle. 
this is actually a difficult problem because there's essentially an infinite number of ways that we could deform the teapot and the ducky to avoid that collision, and our planner needs to figure out how to do that appropriately. This last example is a little bit different. Here we can actually have um, motions for molecules. There's two examples shown, actually three examples shown on this slide. In the top one, um, drug design, molecule docking, there's this drug, is this green molecule here, two different versions of it, the shown with the protein with uh, balls and with a ribbon model. And there's a particular spot on the protein surface that the drug molecule needs to fit, and we call it molecule docking. And that's when the, the drug molecule docks into the protein in a particular way, then the reaction that the drug is supposed to make happens. So, but you can imagine this is kind of a motion planning problem where we need to move the, the drug molecule into the surface of the protein. The other things we have here, we have two protein molecules that are moving for, from a, kind of a flat or extended state into their native three-dimensional state, which is the lowest energy state, which is the state where they do what they're supposed to do. And it turns out that this is essentially can be modeled similarly to a robotic arm. And then the last one we have over here is the RNA folding. One difference from these problems, from the problems that we saw so far, is that when we decide the validity or of, a, of a configuration, previously we were mostly just looking at collisions, so we were trying to avoid collisions. In these examples, we're looking for confirmations of the molecules that are low energy. That's what makes them desirable but that's pretty much the only difference. Okay, so those were all examples of um, motion planning problems, and the really amazing thing to me is that they're all solved with the same algorithms, and in fact, with the same code. In our group, we have a basic motion planner that's coded up in C++, and we use it on all those problems. We have to come up with some specialization for each different type of problem. And what I'm going to be able to share with you today is how we do that. And it's using this method, this abstraction called configuration space, and applying it with these um, randomized methods. So first off, we're going to go over what is configuration space. In configuration space, your robot is going to map to a point in this higher dimensional space. And you have a parameter for each degree of freedom of the robot. So here we have a few examples. So if um, my robot is itself just a point in three-dimensional space, then it turns out that the configuration space for that robot is just X, Y, and Z. It's the same as the workspace. Now, if my robot was, in fact, a rigid body, so let's say a brick, okay, then it turns out to have actually a six-dimensional configuration space. So you can imagine, um, maybe you can see me, if I have... This isn't a very good example, but let's say the pin is my uh, robot. If I know one point of that pin, there's many different configurations of it where that point is fixed, where it's touching my finger. So that's why I need additional three angles for that. So it has a six-dimensional configuration space. This next one, imagine that it's a little manipulator that's in the plane of the screen. Well, then if I know alpha, beta, and gamma angles for it, I know what it looks like, so then it's going to have a three-dimensional configuration space. Finally, for our protein examples, we have what's called a two, we use essentially two um, parameters, phi and psi angles, for each amino acid in the protein. And a small protein has about, say, 50 or so amino acids. That means that the configuration space would have 100 dimensions for even a small protein. Okay. So that's how we specify a configuration space. Now, that's only talking about the points of the robot itself. We also have to have points of, that indicate robot placements. So all possible values of configuration space are all possible robot placements. Some of them will be feasible, some of them will be infeasible. So for example, if I had a configuration, if I was a robot and I had a configuration of me so that I was through like uh, another obstacle, that would be an infeasible configuration of me. I can't show that to you, but that would correspond to a configuration space obstacle. And if you have um, a point where the robot is in 
collision with two different obstacles in the workspace, that would be a point where it's in collision with in, in more than one configuration space obstacle simultaneously. Okay? So let's move on and now think about how we can imagine motion planning in the workspace versus motion planning in configuration space. So motion planning in the workspace, I might have a configuration, may, say my robot's a triangle and I want to move from this bottom right corner to the, bot, to the upper left corner. And I have these four obstacles I need to uh, avoid. In configuration space, my point, robot's going to be a point, and it needs to move from the lower right to the upper left. So the bad news here is that I have transformed those really simple rectangular obstacles into these very complicated, yucky configuration space obstacles that are difficult to deal with. That's unfortunately one of the drawbacks of configuration space. But on the other hand, what we've done is we have transformed our path that was a swept volume into just a one-dimensional bolt curve. And it'll be like that for any robot. It's always going to be a point in configuration space and a one-dimensional curve. Okay, so now let's have another poll. In this poll, I want you to think about what we just learned about configuration space. And the question is, in configuration space, the robot is represented by what? Either a shape with the same dimension and volume as the robot, a point, a line, or you're not sure of the answer. So think about what we just thought about, what talked about, and what were the kind of advantages of configuration space. I remember when I first learned about configuration space, that I thought it was like so simple and easy, and then when I actually tried to start using it, I realized it was a lot more complicated than I thought. But the, the basic idea of it is really beautiful and simple, and it does generalize to many different kinds of, of um, problems. I think we should get the solutions to the poll pretty soon, or do I need to do it? The poll is ended, okay. We're going to see solutions soon, maybe. Nancy, you can just keep uh, talking until the results come in. Okay, should I keep going? Yeah, and then we'll just, when the results come in, okay. you can show them. It's not letting me keep going. Oh, there we go. So what about the complexity of motion planning? So most of you are computer science students that are listening. And um, one thing that's unfortunate is that motion planning is hard. And there is actually a complexity result that tells us that. And essentially what it tells us is the best algorithm we have today, which was developed by a, pro a guy who's a professor at Berkeley now, but in his PhD thesis back in 1986, which was before even I studied computer science, um, that's still the best algorithm we have. And we can't even apply it to a rigid body in three dimensions. So essentially, we can't use it. So what did we do? We did what we've always done with, um, when, in computer science when we have problems like this, is we turn to randomized algorithms. And that's what I'm going to share with you soon. And now I'm looking at the um, poll results. And it looks like we did pretty well. The poll results show that 58% of you um, selected that the, in configuration space, the robot is a point. That's correct. So in that quick bit of, of out of time, it seems that you, most of you caught the idea. The shape was the next most popular answer. That's not quite correct. One of the advantages is we always move the, um, the robot is just a point in configuration space. But good job, actually, guys. Okay, so now let's talk about planning in configuration space. There's basically kind of two variants of these planners. One is a multi-query planning, and that's where we want to try to solve multiple queries in the same environment. So you can do like work and build a roadmap in advance, which you can use over and over again to solve your queries. Um, the next thing is what's called a single query planning, where you're just interested in solving one particular start goal query, and so you don't want to spend a lot of time during pre-processing. 
we're going to talk about problems like the first one. And I'm going to give you a primer on this. Um, this method was developed uh, independently by two different groups of researchers back in 1996, by Lydia Kavraki and her advisor Jean-Claude Latome during her PhD work, and by Petter Seveska and Mark Overmars, and his, uh, who was his advisor, um, is part of his PhD work. What we do is during the roadmap construction phase, which is during preprocessing, we are going to generate, randomly generate um, robot configurations. And what we'll do is we will generate them, and each one we'll test, and we'll keep the ones that are valid. Those are the blue ones in this image. And we'll discard the ones that are invalid, the red ones. We test those using our favorite collision detection method, typically. Then, for each sample that was valid that we kept, we are going to use some simple planning method to try to connect the start, that, that initial method, to its other ones. And we're going to discard the paths that are invalid. So in this example here, I'm going to try to connect oops, the, this, mess, this point here to these four other points, and three of them were successful, that one, that one, and that one, and this one that's the red dotted line is not successful. And I do that independently for every sample, and once I'm done with that, I have my roadmap, the blue lines here and the dark blue vertices. After this, we're now ready to solve um, queries. So during query processing, I have my qu query. I know the start and the goal. What we do is we try to connect them to the roadmap using the same method that we did before. And now I can use my favorite graph search technique, like Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm, to select a path in the roadmap. And now I can solve that query. Now, this was a really revolutionary method when it was first proposed back in the, in the mid-1990s. Um, it was able to, to be applied to robots that had very many degrees of freedom, like a robot arm with many links. And that was pretty revolutionary. And they were also able to solve queries very quickly if they had done enough pre-processing, like built a good enough roadmap. They also have this property that they are what's known as probabilistically complete. Essentially what that means, if we take enough samples, that eventually you will end up with a roadmap that's connected enough that you will actually have all representative paths in your space. However, some of you are probably looking at this and thinking you see some problems. And in fact, there are. It's, they don't work well for some problems. The, the main really idea for this is that they don't work well in what's called the narrow passage problem. So if, if this was my environment, in these region between these two C obstacles, it's a narrow region and it's difficult for me to make samples there. So if I needed to move through them to solve my query, this method that we just talked about won't work very well. And in fact, in, um, for the last 20 years, which I've been a professor, I've been working on designing um, these methods that work well for these kind of problems. And what I want to do is share with you now one of the first ones that we came up with. It's called OBPRM, or Obstacle-Based PRM, Probabilistic Roadmap Method. And it's basically, um, you know, we're trying to solve this problem. When you look at this problem and you do uniform sampling and you just uniformly sample points in this space, where most of your space points are going to be is the places where it's easy, in these open areas. And that's basically where you don't need them. In fact, we need them here. So the idea that we came up with was, to try to sample points on the surfaces of the configuration space obstacles, because that's actually where we need them and that's where planning is tough. But the problem is we can't explicitly construct these configuration space obstacles, although in this image it looks simple, but if you remember that um, sampling, motion planning is P space hard, so we actually can't afford to do it. On the other hand, we do have the, the workspace obstacles, and that's what we exploited in this method. So here's how it works. Um, I start off with some point that's in collision, which you can generate. You just you know your obstacle, your workspace obstacle, and your robot, so you can just generate a configuration where they overlap. Okay. Then you select a random direction in configuration space. You look for a point in that direction that's free, and once you do that, you're home free. We can do a bisection search to try to converge on a point near the surface. So I take the midpoint and I see that it's in collision, so I'm now going to continue looking at the midpoint between two and three. 
When I do that, now it's free, so now I want to continue with the midpoint between those two. And I basically stop whenever it's close enough. And that's basically how the method works. And that was the very first method that I came up with in motion planning. And I was hooked and continued. And it turns out that that started a whole bunch of other people, including my group and others, to come up with many different variants of that basic method to address these challenges. And what I want to do is show you one more that was um, fairly recently um, developed by one of my current, um, my students who recently graduated, Jory Denny, who's now a professor at the University of Richmond. He just finished his fresh, uh, first year there. And Kenson Shi, who was a high school student who worked with me and Jory, and he is now a Stanford undergraduate, should be graduating just about now. And he actually won the Siemens um, science competition, the national one, using this method. But here's the basic idea. In the traditional method, we are trying to map the free configuration space. But if I give you these two problems, it's really hard to tell the difference between them. This one, it's actually not possible to move between the top and the bottom. But in, on the one on the left, it is. There's a narrow passage. But how could I possibly figure the difference between these two if I'm just sampling, doing the method that we talked about? So the idea we had here was, well, why don't we map both the free configuration space and the blocked configuration space? In this case, if I did that, I'd end up with one connected component in the one where it's actually blocked, and I'd have two connected components in the block space here. How would I, what would this happen with me? Well, at some point, I'm going to try to connect um, the, make a connection between the a point on this side of the block space and that one on the other, and it's going to fail. Okay. Well, when it fails, what's it going to do? How, what's the witness to that? It's a point in the other space. And so we can add that to the other space. So I don't want to spend too much time here because I want to move on to something else. But the bottom line is it turned out that this works really well um, for certain types of problems, and problems in particular where we past the space where the um, narrow region kind of separates the space. Um, and it works well and doesn't really depend too much on how narrow that space is, which was really a um, useful um, result. I think maybe I would skip this poll because I think I'm going a little bit slower than I anticipated. I want to share a few more examples with you. If you're interested, we can come back to this question later on. So what are a few challenges in trying to use um, uh, these sampling-based planners? Well, one of them is how do we deal with collaboration? That would be like collaboration between a human and a robot or between two robots. Um, and another one is scaling to large systems, like multi-robot systems where we have hundreds or thousands of agents and also maybe um, uh, crowd uh, simulation type examples, or try to use it with autonomous vehicles. So I'm going to go over a couple examples here to just kind of give you a flavor of things we've tried. So um, here we have a hybrid human planner system. Now, the motivation for this is, remember this problem from early on? This is a problem that um, the you know, GE was interested in solving. But it turned out it was a really hard problem for a motion planner. And when you look at that, you're probably maybe puzzled and think, this is, doesn't look like a hard problem to figure out what the path would look like. I look at it, it's very clear what the path would look like. So the idea we had is that we could let the user kind of sketch the solution path for the planner, but not be required to make sure that it's precisely correct, because maybe it's really tough for them to do it precise to avoid all collisions, and then give that as an input to the planner. So let's say that the user sketched a path that was kind of roughly close to correct path, but not all the way there. Then we could ask the planner to correct the path. Now, the, the interesting thing about this is we thought this would be good because it actually limits, tells the planner where to search, which limits the, the part of the configuration space that the planner should look, which should allow it to to be more efficient. We originally started looking at this method 
for um, actually doing molecule docking for drug design because I had a collaborator who was interested in that. And then we applied it to this um, computer-aided design example. So here's um, some results from that that I like to show, um, which kind of makes my case, but not completely. So here we show the results show um, three different versions of this flange problem. One, this 0.85, means that we shrunk the tube to be 85% of its original size. The next one, we shrunk it to be 95% of its original size. That's the one that's shown there. And then we had it being its original shot size, which is the animation that's shown. And we had, um, for the 0.85 version of the problem, we took the um, planner, the fully auto, uh, automatic planner, OBPRM, and we saw, were able to solve that problem. And, but it took about 500 seconds. When we used the haptic push, which is a haptic is a, a, for, a virtual reality device that lets you have force feedback so that the user could attach the virtual reality device to the, one of the objects and move it around and kind of feel things. When they collected their path using that, they were able, the planner was able to fix that path in just a few seconds. When we moved on to the next version of the problem, we could have solved it with our fully automatic method, but it would have taken too long, and so we didn't show it here. You see that we were able to solve it with about 3,000 seconds using that version where the user collected the trajectory and we passed it off to the planner. But this yellow one is one I find pretty interesting. Here, we took the solution path for the .85 version of the problem, and we passed it as input to the .95 version of the problem. And it turned out that the planner was able to fix that one up really easily, a lot quicker. And in fact, that's how we solved the original version of the problem, is we took the solution path for the point 0.95 and passed it as input to the original version. So what this unfortunately doesn't show is it doesn't make my case that it works better with a human, because we could have solved this problem directly from the making the easier version of the path problem and passing it on. And another problem, remember this like um, uh, alpha puzzle type problem? This is one that this solution doesn't work well to because I don't look at it and I can't really figure out nicely what the solution path looks like. But this is still some kind of hint to tell us that there's something going on here, and this is an area that we are um, working further on. Now, the last thing I want to share with you is um, how we might work on these multi-agent systems. So flocking systems from computer graphics are sol solutions systems that are good for simulating motions of like a fish, schools of fish or birds in the sky. Um, they're very local. Each agent looks around just to its neighbors and determines what it's going to do based on how its neighbors are moving. Um, they're, good at they're not good at complex navigation, like if the fish needed to go to a particular place and there's many different routes. But that's what these roadmap-based planners are good at. Oh, this one is not playing. This is a cute one. Here we have a dog herding some, a flock of geese. But it turns out these roadmap-based systems are good at the complex navigation. So what we did in my group is we took together, put these two things together, and we came up with roadmap-based flocking. So kind of roughly how it might work is we have a map encoding the global information, the topology, and it's basically a data structure we can use for storing and accessing information. And it can also be used for implicit communication among the group members. And the agents just behave like normal. So for example, if our goal was to cover this full environment, if the, when the agents come to kind of a branch in the roadmap, they would be more likely to take the route that hasn't been taken very much. Um, on the other hand, if they want to all follow the same route, they'd be more likely to take the route that's been taken before. So based on how we want to, what behavior we want to replicate, we can put in different behavior there. So um, here's the one that I showed you uh, earlier on, actually in the beginning. Um, what we're doing um, in my group now recently to try to make these kinds of methods work is to use workspace skeletons to guide the planners. So what this means is we're coming up with a skeleton, which you can kind of view as a type of a roadmap that represents the workspace, and we're trying to let the planner use that to, um, to guide its work. 
some of the summer students we have working here, the Drew students we have working here this summer are working on things that will be supportive of this problem. And one other example, interesting example of this, let's see these things are, some of them are plain. Yes, these are some multi-agent systems that we developed through a collaboration with um, colleagues in the Department of Architecture. What they're interested in doing is using crowd simulations to evaluate various architectural designs. For example, they want to come up with a hospital design that will maximize patient and staff comfort and reduce stress. One of the ways they do that is to have routes that expose people to more natural light or things that might encourage people to walk more that will be more healthy. And so there's a lot of interesting things that we can look into here, which basically are bringing together motion planning and together with other disciplines. Okay, so hopefully you are a little bit amazed, like I still am today after 20 years working on these, of the, number, the range of diverse problems that can be addressed using appropriate adaptations of these sampling-based motion planners. The key is really to designing the appropriate models for these different C spaces. And if you can learn more by working, looking at my group's web pages. Now I have to show here um, my students because they're the ones who have actually done all the work. Um, this picture here on the upper right I love to show. This is a picture of with me and at what were at then at that point 11 of my current students and eight of my former students that were there with some of their own students. So my grand students were there in that um, picture, which I love. And this was actually at the ICRA conference that I was a program chair, and it was in Seattle, which is my hometown, and all the organizers for that conference were women, which was like a first and probably will never, ever happen. So it was a pretty awesome experience. What's shown here over here is kind of another fun thing. The actual most famous uh, member of my group, that's Kenson Shi, who developed the toggle PRM with Jory Denny. That's him standing in Times Square with his own image on the Times Square reader board after he won that competition. And there's a lot of my other students here, which I won't list them all at this point. So um, that's it for the this part of the presentation. So Lori, should we? We have time for about two questions, and then I encourage everybody to write their questions on the question and answer, and we will um, we will get them answered in the chat after the talk is the webinar is over. Okay. So here's the first question: What topics should I study if I want to do motion planning? Well. The most students can start working with me as a freshman, really. Um, the, the most important thing to really have is uh, some kind of basic algorithms and data structures because if you notice, we saw a lot of graphs there. That's pretty much what we're doing. We're building graphs and we're searching graphs and um, that's one thing. Another thing a little bit more advanced would maybe be something about, um, well, programming is also useful. Uh, to, to understand, but those I would say were the, ba the two basics. Okay, uh, let's see, another question. What kind of real-world applications will allow the user to help in motion planning algorithm? Great question, <laughs> um, and if you um, have some ideas, I'd love to hear them. One that I'm currently um, thinking about is for if we have a robotic manipulator that needs to work in a hazardous environment, let's say there was that Fukushima disaster in Japan you might have heard about, which was at a nuclear power plant, and they needed to go in there and manipulate things. Well, if we have a good planning for the robotic manipulator, that would be a very useful thing. Now, on the other hand, Human insight is important there because we don't really know what we see, so we need to do some kind of remote controlled type thing. So we are actually developing methods where we can have the motion planner um, kind of show the user what could actually be reached by the robot, and then the user could provide some guidance as to which way the robot should move. Hmm. Okay. We have another question here. Uh, how should I look into 
motion planning if it is not an area of research or major at my university? So motion planning probably won't be a major anywhere, although I think maybe it could be. Um, but some, play, some universities will have robotics courses, and typically in a robotics class, especially if it's taught in the computer science department, there'll be a segment on motion planning. But if you don't, if you're not lucky enough to have that or have a faculty member at your university, there are actually some really excellent um, motion planning texts that are available for free, and I can provide references for those later on so, so that you could look at that. And I'd be happy to give you pointers, too. Okay, great. So why don't we move on to the mentoring part of the talk? Okay, great. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about now is reference letters, why they're important and how to cultivate them. So first off, what are references? Well, references are a common part of many application processes. Um, you might have needed them to go get into your undergraduate studies, if you're a Drew student, you needed one to um, be selected for the, apply for the program. If you want to apply for a scholarship or some other award, you need a reference letter. And what, what is the point of the reference letter? The reference letter is really intended to provide additional information that's going to allow the selection committee to determine how well you meet the requirements of the position or the award. And a good reference can really help you nail that position or award and a poor or a lukewarm re reference could lose you an opportunity for which you are otherwise well qualified. Maybe you're the best candidate, but if you don't have the appropriate references lined up, you might lose that opportunity. So just a note, um, what I'm going to be talking about is going to be most um, kind of in the context of looking for a reference for a graduate school application or for a fellowship or scholarship application, but it basically holds true for all references. You would just need to um, kind of map it appropriately to your case. So in this session, we're going to talk about a couple things. What makes for a good or a not good reference letter? Who to ask or not to ask for a reference? And how you should ask or not ask for a reference? So first, let's have a poll. Um, this poll asks you, what makes for a not good reference letter? And what you should do is remember, you should pick one of the answers. A letter that compares you to students in your peer group at your institution in your major. B, a letter that compares you to others who have had the internship job or award that you are seeking. A letter that describes your accomplishments in an area unrelated to the internship job or award. A letter that summarizes items apparent from your resume or transcript. A letter that provides details about a project in which you are involved in your role in that project. Um, none of the above or all of the above. So when you're answering this, think about um, what we said about the purposes of the letter. It's to provide information that's going to aid whoever's going to select the person um, for the award, and it's a complement to your other application materials. So um, do you think it would make sense that it would be something that summarizes items apparent from your resume or transcript. Um, probably not, right? Um, one case is one thing that's kind of maybe a little bit, are we going to get a solution here pretty soon, you think? Okay, the poll's ended, so hopefully we'll get a solution pretty soon. Um, some of these things are pretty clear cut and some of them aren't. So one thing, you know, I think that you probably saw that a letter that compares you to students in your peer group at your institution or major is obviously would be a good thing. One that compares you to others who have had the position or award that you're seeking would also be good. Now C, um, some of you selected C, and on the surface that might not seem like a good answer, but um, actually it might be a letter that describes your accomplishments in an area unrelated to the internship job or award. Maybe though that even though the area is different, maybe some of the characteristics uh, that allowed you to be successful in that position were, can be transformed to the other. So that might actually be a good choice. Um, so let's see. D is not a good choice. 
And some of you have selected that. It looks like a lot of you selected that. Um, a letter that summarizes items apparent from your resume or transcript. Think about it. You don't need that because as part of the application materials, you're going to have your resume or your transcript provided. If they care about it, they'll ask for it. And you should provide it if you're allowed to provide that. So something that just summarizes things that are already available is not going to make for a, a reference that will distinguish you from others. Okay, let's move on to the next one. This one asks about who not to ask for a reference. Okay, um, and again, we're assuming here, assume here that the reference is for graduate studies or for a fellowship for, to support you in graduate school. A tenure track faculty who you did research with. A tenure track faculty who you had in a graduate course. You, you, as an undergraduate, you took a graduate course from a faculty member. Um, a tenure track faculty member who you had in a computer science course assuming it's for computer science graduate studies. A tenure track faculty who you had in a history course. A teaching focused faculty member who you had in a CS course. Okay, so here's, let's talk a little bit about the difference between tenure track faculty and a teaching focused faculty. So in, at most institutions, if you're at an institution which is a research university, the tenure track faculty like me are required to do as part of our job teaching, research, and service. And so we are called tenure track faculty. There are also faculty who might have various different titles at your institution that whose primary job is to do teaching, but they don't necessarily do research, okay? They might have the title of lecturer, they might have the title of instructional professor, they might have the title of professor of the practice. If you're unsure, you could talk to one of the faculty members at your institution to understand the different roles. Okay, a graduate student that maybe you um, worked with in research, a teaching assistant, so a TA of one of the courses you took, a supervisor at your work, assume that the work is not research related, a coworker, your roommate, longtime family friends, um, your parents and grandparents. Some of you may be laughing. But I'll tell you, actually, for a professional award that I was um, evaluating just recently, um, somebody had their mother write them a reference. Um, so then none of the above or all of the above. So the poll is ended. Let's see. We have only, it doesn't look like too many people participated just yet, or maybe it didn't show up yet. But right now we have only, the only answer that looks like that anyone gave that I can see is, no, that's not quite true. So 15% um, chose A, tenure track faculty that you did research with. 15% chose J, your roommate, and you're joking us, I guess. And then 54% chose a parent. Are you guys, like, making fun of me here? <laughs> huh? The nod is in parentheses. Yeah. So Deanne tells me that I had a poor poll question. But, um, you know, the bottom line here is that the ones that would be good choices would likely be A, a faculty member you did research with, a faculty member that you had in it would be probably the top choice, okay, assuming that they are able to, that you did a good job with the research. Um, a faculty member that you had in a graduate course would also be a great idea because they could talk about you and how you performed relevant, relevant to other graduate students, even though you're just a, still an undergrad. Um, but the parent and grandparent, <coughs> again, think about it. If they are able to provide you an unbiased recommendation, there could be extenuating circumstances where any of these would be good choices. But the real thing to keep in mind is you're looking for someone who can comment on the characteristics that are going to be important for the position that you want or the award that you want. Okay. Next one. And the last poll. Okay. How, so answer this poll as to how to ask for a reference, okay? Forget about the not there, in case it was my fault for the last time. Um, here's one option. Send them an initial email and follow up with additional emails daily until they agree. Ask them one day before it's due. Track them down in the parking lot if they haven't answered your emails and stalk them. 
Assume they remember all the details of what you did in their class two and a half years ago. Assume they will be familiar with the internship job or award and don't need you to provide any information about it. Assume they are completely aware of all your accomplishments and don't provide them a copy of your resume or drafts of your application materials. Finally, spread out your reference requests over many faculty members to, amount, to reduce the amount of work you ask each one. That's very considerate of you. Okay, so please pick the one that you think is the best answer here. There's either all of the above and none of the above as well. So let's start talking about some of these situations while you're still answering. Um, the one that I think, hopefully these are pretty obvious to you, but the bottom line is remember, faculty members are very busy. They know many, many students, and so they may not remember you if they haven't heard from you a few years ago if you interacted with them last a few years ago. So how can you solve that problem? Number one is you can stay in touch with the faculty members. If you had a and I've had students that I had it when they were freshmen and I never had them in class again, but basically once a semester they'd stop by and they'd tell me what they were up to or they'd drop me an email and tell me when they got a cool internship or when they did something interesting. And I actually remembered those students. And when it came time when they were senior and they wanted me to write them a letter, I actually could say that I knew them and had interacted with them even though I'd never had any formal interaction with them except for that class their freshman year. Okay. The other thing is we're busy. Um, we travel a lot. We have other deadlines. We do things that you know we are, you know we don't have a lot of time. So you need to give us time to plan. So you definitely want to ask as soon as possible. You know, six months out is probably more than you need. But if you have you no know, a couple months in advance, start asking them about a couple months in advance. Um, let's see. We have some results up here. I see that. Almost half of you, 48% of you, picked um, none of the above. That's actually what I would put as the best answer here. 21% um, of you picked G, spread out your reference requests over many faculty members to reduce the amount of work you ask each one. That's actually a common misperception that students have. Um, once I write one letter, it's really, really, really easy for me to send it out to a jillion other places. So there's really no... Um, savings to me, very minimal if you do, if you ask me to do one letter versus five letters or even 20 letters. And on the other hand, there's probably just a very small number of people who could really provide you a strong reference. So you're better off deciding who those people are and use them over and over again. So that's, you know, many students, they really feel like they're being, you know, too pushy if they ask for a ton of letters. Don't worry about it. Once they've written you one, they can write you any number of them. Okay, so you guys did well on this poll. I think it was my fault because I didn't like make the poll clear up until that. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have a little bit of a role play. And we're going to have an example of how not to ask for a reference letter and how to ask for a letter of reference. And my um, current PhD student, Deanna Wasu, who was a Drew student a few years back, is going to help out with this. Okay, so DM, let's get started. Come on in. Hi, so Milo. Um, Have a seat. You. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I'd like to ask for a favor, please. Uh, what is that? Um, there is um, an application due tomorrow. To tomorrow? Be, yeah. Um, it's for what? For, it's for uh, API examination. Uh huh. And I'd like to know if you could write me a letter of recommendation, please. Oh, you want me to write a letter for you that's due tomorrow? Yes, um, I apologize. I know. It's but you know, I'm leaving like in five minutes to go out of town. Yeah. Um, how long have you known about this letter? Um, for about three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, I was I was kind of busy preparing all the the other stuff that I needed to submit there is quite a lot. And you didn't think to give me any warning? Yeah. Um, yeah I'm sorry about that. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't think I can write you much of a letter. I haven't written you a letter before. You know, the first time I need to have some time in all your materials. Do you have your materials ready to share with me? I can try to do it on the plane, but I'm leaving right now. Can um, you give them to me? 
I'm thinking I can print them. I actually submitted the rest of the application. It was due like three days ago. Oh, you so submitted I, it already? Yeah. Oh, goodness. Uh, I asked some colleagues in the lab to review it with me. It should be okay. Okay. Well, um, I'll still see what I can do, but um, it's, you know, I don't have now the opportunity to help you with your materials either. So yeah. please, please don't do this again. Yeah, I'm very sorry. No. Thank you. Okay. All right. Oh, geez. <laughs> okay. Now we will try to see how it could be done a little bit better. Come on in. Hi, Dr. Um, oh, hi, Deanne. Come on in. Are you, you. here about the, what you emailed me about yesterday? Yes. Okay, yeah. good. And so, uh, yeah, I sent you the material, but I just bring them out just so I can review them. Oh, together. thank you. Um, that's so what is this for? Remind me again. So this is it's for the ABI nomination. Uh -huh. Um and so they were requesting a, a CV and a personal statement. But I also printed out their description. Oh, thank you. So you brought me the description, yeah. your C V and your draft statement. Yes. Okay. I glanced at it a little bit at when you sent it yesterday. Mm -hmm. So remind me, we have plenty of time before this is due, right? When yes. is it due? Yeah, it's due at the end of the month. So we have about three three more weeks. Okay. And what else do you need as part of the application? You just the only thing you need left from me is my letter. Yes. Uh, so like I emailed, I emailed you a few days ago. I also needed to add the recommended. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I've already contacted them and they're ready to give me the letters. So yeah, that's all that we need for well, now. Excellent. Well, and after I write this, this will also be really good shape because we can use it for the other scholarship that I need to nominate you for later on. Right, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate it when students are organized and give me all the materials in advance. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Very good okay. That's it. So, should I give back the screen? I forgot. Uh, no, you can, I'll just tell, uh, we'll just continue. I'll just let you know okay. when to hit the slides. So thank you very much for your presentation. I learned a ton. I, I wish I would have changed areas way back when. <laughs> <laughs> There's still time. Very exciting. <laughs> so I think we've run out of time for the questions. On, uh, we're going to take all the questions on the online chat. So if people have questions, what we're going to do is go ahead and uh, can you, Nancy, move the slide one time? We're going to go ahead and ask you for your feedback. Uh, if you can put this URL in or use the, um, the square uh, that's there and then go QR. ahead and start yeah, the QR code. Okay. <laughs> Okay, the QR code. Um, if you could use either of those to go ahead and finish the survey while we also have people bringing in questions, that would be great. And let me tell you a little bit about what is coming up next. Should I go forward or? Yes, please. Yes, that'd be great. So our next webinar is July 27th at 4 o'clock Eastern time, and this webinar is a student. Um, she's a, a student who is going to talk about speed up deep in reinforcement learning via transfer and multitask learning. So it's about machine learning. And she's also going to talk about how to choose a research direction as an undergraduate. So we would hope that all the REU students in particular and some ACMW chapters will join us for that. In, in another month and a half. Um, so let's move on to the last slide. So on this slide, you can see this this webinar is sponsored by a CRAW, and there are some resources, some lots of other resources beyond the webinar for you. So you can use these uh, resources as we close this uh, webinar. So we're going to close the actual official webinar, and, and Nancy, thank you again for 
all your time and effort in putting this together and your student. And what we're going to do is move on into a conversation as an online chat with Nancy after these concluding comments. So the webinar is going to switch to an online chat forum as soon as this presentation ends. Um, we appreciate you all joining us today, and we hope that you'll keep tuning in for some of, some of the other um, webinars as they're coming up. We've got several of them planned.